All right, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, nice to be back. A uh, couple of things I wanted to flag. One is on the situation along the Kyrgyz-Tajik uh, border. The Secretary General has been following developments along the Kyrgyz-Tajik border with concern. He extends his condolences for the lives lost in the clashes last week and wishes a speedy recovery for those involved. Secretary General also welcomes the ceasefire that was agreed on on May 1st and welcomes the contacts that have been taking place between the presidents, prime ministers, and foreign ministers of the two countries. And he urges both sides to take all measures necessary to ensure that the ceasefire holds. The Secretary General um, also notes that his special representative for Central Asia, Natai German, remains in direct contact with the authorities on both sides and reiterates the UN's readiness to, um, to provide support as necessary. Uh, also on El Salvador, um, we're also following that situation uh, very closely. The Secretary General takes note of the concerns expressed regarding the procedures used in the dismissal of members of the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Justice and its impact on the system of checks and balances in El Salvador. The Secretary General calls for respect of constitutional provisions, the rule of law, and the division of powers with a view to preserving the democratic progress achieved by the Salvadoran people since the signing of the peace agreement. Uh, just a programming note that in a short while, the Secretary General will deliver remarks at a ses special session of the S General Assembly uh, in the memory of late President Idris uh, Deby of Chad. Uh, those remarks will be shared with you. And today is World Press Freedom Day, as you all know, and this year's theme is Information as a Public Good. In his message for the day, the Secretary General said that the global challenges we faced during the COVID-19 pandemic underline the critical role of reliable, verifiable, and universally accessible information in saving lives and building strong, resilient societies. He noted that in too many countries, journalists and the media workers run great personal risks, including res new restrictions, censorship, abuse, harassment, detention, and even death simply for doing their jobs. The Secretary General also pointed out that the economic impact of the pandemic has hit many media outlets hard, threatening the very, their very survival. He urges all governments to do everything in their power to support a free, independent, and diverse media. Uh, and in relations to press freedom, the UN country team in Myanmar calls for the immediate release of dozens of journalists who are still detained more than th for more than three months after the military seized control of the government. To date, military authorities have revoked the operating licenses of six major Myanmar media outlets. Some 82 journalists have been arrested. More than half of them are still detained. And a note uh, on the situation in India, where the UN team is supporting the authorities to address the COVID-19 pandemic, including by addressing misinformation. Our team on the ground is working to promote the Secretary General's verified campaign, which, as you'll recall, was launched last year to deliver trusted information and life-saving advice. UNICEF in India continues to help with the national vaccination strategy. The agency is translating messages in many languages and stepping up its work with communities across 16 states. Myth-busting campaigns and others have reached more than 21 million people in both rural and urban areas. Nearly 650,000 frontline workers have been trained on promoting key messages on vaccines. The UN team is also working with community radio stations across the country to reach more than 17 million people in rural areas on how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 um, and also on the importance of vaccines. Uh, more information available for you on various web platforms. Um, turning to the Central African Republic, over the weekend, the UN mission uh, in that country has deployed engineering materials and equipment in the capital bong, uh, to repair electrical towers and cables damaged during a rainstorm on the 23rd, which caused a power outage. The water supply was also impacted by the power outage, and our colleagues at the peacekeeping mission are providing a generator to help ensure access to water. Power is now partially restored in Bangui, and the mission's ongoing work in support of the government continues to bring normalization of electricity to the capital. On the electoral front, the mission is telling us that the Constitutional Court validated the election of 68 members of parliament elected on March 14th. 
This brings the total number of elected MPs to 90, who will be sworn in on May 3rd. There are 11 women among them. 50 seats of the National Assembly are now to be contested in the next round of legislative elections scheduled for May 23rd. Quick note on Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Today marks the end of the 12th Ebola outbreak in the country. The virus reemerged in North Kivu in February, nine months after the previous outbreak in the same province was declared over. The head of WHO in Africa, uh, Dr. Moeti, said that we must stay alert for a possible resur resurgence of the virus while using the growing expertise on emergency response to address other health threats at, that the country faces. WHO continues to work with the Democratic Republic of the Congo to fight other public health problems, such as outbreaks of measles and cholera, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a weak health system. You will have seen over the weekend we issued two statements, one on Somalia, <clears throat> in which the Secretary General welcomed the decision of the lower house of the federal parliament in Somalia to nullify the special law in federal elections and return to the electoral modalities outlined in the sep September 17th electoral agreement. The Secretary General reiterates his call for all Somali stakeholders to resume dialogue immediately and forge consensual agreement on the holding of inclusive elections without further delay. He further stresses the importance of broad-based consensus in the country's uh, stability. And in another statement issued over the weekend, the Secretary General condemned the suicide in Puli al Alam in uh, Afghanistan that took place on the 30th of, of April on Friday. He hopes that the observation of the holy month of Ramadan, a time for contemplation and compassion, will be an occasion to reflect on those who have been affected by the prolonged conflict in the country and to come together in renewed efforts towards peace. As you will know, at 3.30 p.m. this afternoon, the permanent representative of the People's Republic of China, Ambassador Zhang Jun, will be here to brief you in his capacity as president of the Security Council for the month of May. And tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there will be a press briefing here by the President of General Assembly, moderated by our friend Brendan, who will tell you more about it in a few minutes. Celia. Stefan, it's about Chad. As you know, the situation has deteriorated. Mali, Sudan, Niger, and probably Nigeria will be impacted by the situation. What can the UN do to prevent the situation from getting worse? And as you know, there is a problem in Libya where Chadian mercenaries are not uh, welcome to Chad. So where are they going to go? Look, uh, it, it's obvious that the, uh, the situation, uh, the events in Chad uh, may very well have an impact in the, in the broader region. Our focus is, it remains on, um, on working to build uh, stability in Chad and in the region, uh, in the region beyond. Um, Mr. Lonsenifal, the Secretary General, Special Representative for Central Africa, was in uh, was in Chad recently. He's now gone back to Libreville, uh, but he remains in contact with the African Union, the Community of Central African States. Uh, obviously, the UN system is also very um, uh, following very closely what is going on in the Sahel as as a whole. Um, on the issue of uh, of um, of mercenaries, uh, whether whatever nationality they are in Libya, uh, Libya will be better off without mercenaries. It is it is important that obviously when you're looking uh, when you're looking at Chad that there is also a um, a, a process of reconciliation, of political reconciliation, uh, so that the country moves away from internal armed conflict uh, and towards a greater stability. But Chad does not want them I, back. No, I, I, that's, that's, so, that's why I'm talking is like whenever, and I, you know, whether you talk about Chad or other countries, uh, if there is an internal conflict, it is obviously for political reasons. So there needs to be a political solution to that. And we are there to support the Chadians on that. Ray, and then uh, Ibtissam. Thank you, Stefan. 
the Israeli government said that they will resume negotiations with Lebanon in Nakora tomorrow, Tuesday. Any comment on that? Thank you. Uh, I have not uh, seen that, but obviously we welcome any sort of uh, any dialogue directly or uh, under whatever auspices between the two, uh, the two countries. But I'm, I'll get you something on, on that. If to some. Thank you, Steph. On Libya, so uh, 11 uh, immigrants uh, drowned yesterday off the uh, coast of Libya. Uh, that brings the total number of uh, immigrants who tried to cross to Europe, and uh, we know about that they uh, um, died, uh, 600 people s since the beginning of the year. The Norwegian um, Refugee Council issued a statement saying that this tragedy and those before were completely avoidable uh, had the European, uh, had Europe uh, stepped up and allowed uh, re uh, rescue missions to bring migrants uh, and refugees to safety rather than shifting the blame on others. What's your comment and what do you, uh, what's your comment on that first? Look, the, We've been reporting, whether from here or other colleagues have been reporting regularly on the tragic uh, deaths of men, women, and children who are just trying to seek a better life uh, for themselves. Um, there has been, I think, and clearly to all, a lack of global solidarity um, when it comes uh, to migrants and refugees. Uh, especially when you look at the situation in the Mediterranean. We have always called for a greater um, uh, European solidarity and coordinated uh, efforts. People who are at sea and in danger need to be rescued. The other side of that equation is the situation in Libya. Libya is not a safe place uh, for migrants and, and refugees. We hope that uh, the, the political dialogue that is underway uh, will bring greater stability uh, for Libya. The Libyan authorities also have a responsibility uh, to treat with dignity those who are in their country uh, on the move to, uh, uh, to a better life. But it's clear that so, so many have let down uh, these men, women, and children. Which steps do you want to see European governments we, taking? I think it, it's clear that there needs to be greater, uh, greater European solidarity. European Union itself will have to find an, an internal uh, internal uh, solution, but we need greater solidarity and greater humanity. Evelyn. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, is there an update on Burma, on Myanmar? Uh, more, one NGO after another seems to criticize the UN, the Security Council, ASEAN, and so forth for not doing any, enough. Is there any update on things getting worse, better, whatever? Well, you know, the update on the ground is not one of getting better. Uh, I think just flag the fact uh, on this World Press Freedom Day that so many of your colleagues remain detained, uh, often without charge, and conditions that we can only imagine are, are horrendous. Um, we can all understand the frustration of the people of Myanmar. Uh, given the current situation. For our part, and you know, the Security Council and other parts of the UN have to answer for themselves. For our part, our envoy Christian Schragner Bergener is back in Bangkok. She had, as you know, was in Jakarta, where she had contacts with the military rulers. She is still trying, uh, you, her contacts are ongoing um, in trying to, uh, A, get herself to, uh, to Myanmar and work with other parts of the international community uh, for restoration of the democratic order in Myanmar. Who's the top UN person there? Christine schragner -Berg. No, I mean in the country. Uh, the resident uh, coordinator. Is uh, the resident coordinator in Thailand or is he in? He's in, uh, the, the, he's in, he's in, in Myanmar. Th yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dulcie. Hi, uh, the Secretary General went to the Kentucky Derby this weekend. Uh, who paid for the trip, and was it on a, his public schedule? No, the trip was uh, was a private trip. Uh, the Secretary General had been invited last year by the then U.S. Permanent Representative Kelly Kraft to attend the Derby. As you know, it was not; it did not take uh, place. He was not able to go in 2020. Uh, the hotel was paid uh, directly and personally 
by the Secretary General. There were no additional travel costs to the organization, and had there been, uh, the Secretary General would have, would have paid for it himself. Uh, but how did he get there? How did he get to Kentucky? Uh, he flew commercial. From where? Uh, he flew back. From, he was in Europe and flew back. Uh, and within the uh, within the allotment, I mean, we work on a system of allotment uh, in terms of money. And the the, the trips that he the, the travel that he took to Kentucky and back as part of his trip to Europe uh, was at no additional cost uh, to the organization. Oh, okay. So he paid for the flight from New York to Kentucky and no, back. No, what I'm what I'm saying to you is that he he was in Europe in Geneva. He had been. He'd left New York, uh, what day are we? He f left New York um, about 10 days uh, ago, flew to Europe, and then flew back to Europe, uh, to New York via Kentucky. And what I'm saying to you, there was no additional cost from the budgeted cost of, of the trip. Had there been any, he would have paid for it. Yes, Celia. Uh, Stefan, do we know what the Secretary General and Kitty Craft talked about? I assume horses. <laughs> it was a private trip. <laughs> OK. Um, anything else? Oh, sorry, I forgot there's also people online. I keep Sorry, it's been, I've been gone for too long. Uh, Maggie, and then Toby. Maggie? All right. Uh, Toby, uh, while Maggie warms up her, cranks up her camera and her microphone, Toby, go ahead. Thanks, Deb. Nice to see you. Uh, question on Wolf, World Press Freedom Day. Uh, the Facebook Oversight Board is debating now uh, and expected to announce this week whether or not they're going to allow Donald Trump, former U.S. president, uh, back on their platform. Um, does the SG want to weigh in on this and about uh, you know, these, just the nature of, of public communication now, when we're seeing it degrade and when we're seeing the UN warn of media extinction events, uh, how should we be thinking about, um, about the increasing importance of these platforms in political speech? Oh, welcome back to Toby. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not going to weigh in on the particular decision, whatever Facebook uh, decides. What the Secretary General has, has talked about and has been discussed is uh, the need to obviously to balance uh, the basic human rights of free speech, but also to take into account the dangers of hate speech, of incitement uh, to violence, the responsibility of these private companies uh, to do that, to find the right formula in which uh, to do that. Um, this is part of, of a greater, I would say, multi-stakeholder conversation that needs to be had between governments, uh, the private sector, human rights NGOs, press NGOs, uh, to try to figure out how, uh, how these issues are are managed, uh, whether or not they need to be regulated, uh, but it is a conversation that had to be that needs to be had. There is a right to free speech, but there is also a responsibility to avoid uh, the hate speech that we've seen, the incitement to violence, and the um, and all the sort of negative uh, and very dangerous uh, things that we have seen emanating from these social plat media platforms. Uh, Maggie, have you managed? Um, okay, uh, Kirsten. Can Kirsten, you hear me? So, yes, go oh, ahead. Uh, staff? Yes, go ahead. You've, you, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. To whom? Kirsten or Maggie? Maggie, let's, let's, let's have you while you can speak. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I couldn't unmute before. Yeah, I don't know. It's a little shaky, the connection. Uh, Steph, do you have any update on Tigre? And do you have uh, any efforts by the UN to help uh, lower tensions on the Grand Renaissance Dam? On the dam, uh, the Secretary General uh, continues to be in touch uh, with all the parties, uh, including the African Union, in an effort to support uh, dialogue, the lowering of tensions, uh, and to support, obviously, the, uh, the efforts of the African Union, who are very much in the lead on this issue. 
On, um, on Tigray, we're continuing to, um, to assist uh, all people in need and protection throughout uh, Ethiopia, and including Tigray, in accordance with our you know, humanitarian principles of, of, uh, of impartiality and, and basically based on, on, needs, uh, on needs only. Okay, Ms. Salome, please. Hi, Stefan. Uh, just wondering if you had any update on the UN's response in India to the pandemic. Any any updates? I know Farhan told us last week about some medical supplies, but anything new from from the UN on its response? Not 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 newer than what I just said about five minutes ago. But oh, about we, the, okay. yeah, yeah. There's no. There's nothing. About, there was the info there was no, nothing in my um, in my FAS book that I did not use and did not share with you. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Oh, thank you, Stefan. I have a few questions, too. Uh, I'll start with uh, Yemen. Uh, both envoys, the UN Special Envoy and the US Special Envoy, visited Riyadh, and I asked Mr. Farhan Haq if it was coincidence to be both at the same time in Riyadh, and he said no. And both now they are in Muscat, Oman. So the, I'm asking if they are coordinating their efforts or their trip. Abdel Hamid, I, Ab 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 Hamid, I didn't hear the first part of your question you were referring to. The, the UN Special Envoy on Yemen and the US Special Envoy to Yemen. Both, they visited Riyadh together and they visited Oman together. Are they coordinating their uh, efforts? There, there is no, you know, they both have separate, um, let me just say something. They both share the same, uh, we, we all share the aim of bringing peace to the people of Yemen, uh, but they are not coordinating, uh, they are not coordinating their travel. I mean, one can imagine that the number of places you need to go to uh, to talk about Yemen is pretty, um, pretty small in the region. So. Uh, if people keep going around to the same places, uh, at some point they'll be in the same place at the same time. Okay, my second question. Uh, the Israeli court uh, gave the people of the neighborhood Sheikh Jarrah until Thursday to evacuate so his settlers can come in. It's an open uh, ethnic cleansing. And yet there was no statement neither from the Secretary General or his special envoy on Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. I will uh, I will see if there's an I, I have I haven't seen the court ruling, but I will uh, I will uh, I will check and get back to you. And, okay. and the last thing, uh, a senior woman, 60 year old, her name is Rihad Muhammad Musa Zaoul, was shot at the checkpoint south of Atlanta under the claim that she was attempting to stab anybody, to stab the, uh, the two soldiers, they shot her and she died a few hours later. Uh, and the video shows that she was no threat to the soldiers. You have a... I will check. Uh, I, I, let me check on that particular, on that particular incident. Okay. Uh, yes, Carla. And then we'll go to, um, uh, to Brendan. Thank you very much. Um, has the Security Council passed any ruling to protect many of these migrants who have ended up, I, I gather from today, uh, 600 people drowning in the Mediterranean this year? Because many of them are fleeing from countries that were destroyed as a consequence of Security Council authorization of uh, bombing basically uh, Iraq, Libya, so forth. So uh, the Security Council would have a responsibility to protect these people who are trying uh, to... Carla, I think, uh, as I said, our, our, we have raised, we have talked about uh, the horrendous situation and the, the, the deadly situation being faced by migrants in Libya and, and other places in the Mediterranean. Uh, the question you raise is a very valid one, and I think it's a perfect one to ask uh, Ambassador Zhang Jun when he's here at 3.30 uh, and as president of the Security Council. 